This is Scott Reich, a criminal defense attorney who's practiced law for the past 25 years. I have represented many individuals in high-profile cases. Today, Scott is going to break down what Hollywood gets right and wrong on television court scenes. I'm currently here in my office. I'm the only one here. We're trying to keep everybody safe with this quarantine. First up, better call Saul. Thank you for coming in today, Mr. Harkness. I just want to clarify a few things from your testimony, if that's OK. OK. So you were working at the Sandia Mart the night of the 30th, is that correct? Got in at noon, left at midnight. The one thing this scene does very well is the fact that it shows that the defense attorney is questioning the basis for the reliability of the identification. The identification is essential in any criminal case because they want to make sure that they get the right person. Sounds like it happened pretty fast, but you say you got a good look at him, correct? Yes. <laughs> you must drink stronger coffee than I do because after 11 hours on the job, I can barely see straight. And it was dark out. And so here, the attorney is questioning how tired they were, uh, what the lighting was correct, how quickly events happened, distracted by other events. He all but says, are you sure it's my guy? I mean, he is really the only guy sitting over here at the defense table. His, you know, there's a little defendant on the tag on the table there. Are you sure that's the person? There's no doubt in your mind. Take your time. I don't need time, that's him. At this moment, this clip takes a huge turn. Now, would you be surprised to learn, Mr. Harkness, that the person you just pointed to is not the defendant? What? My client is in the back of the courtroom. Mr. Sakey, would you please stand up? And then he has his real client stand up. That would never take place in a real courtroom. It is named Hollis Early. He's a bartender down in Berlin. What? He has a very good alibi for the night in Your question. Your Honor, objection. Oh, oh Mr. Goodman. Really? You didn't recognize him either, Your Honor. An attorney cannot deceive the court like that by having the defendant sit out there and having somebody else sit at the defense table. Unrealistic, would never happen. You'd probably get sanctioned by the judge. Next up, the good wife. In this scene, we have an attorney asking a witness a question. The witness then asserts her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Did you and Mr. Kimball stay together in Washington, D.C.? I refuse to answer on the grounds that it may incriminate me. At this point, the judge would more than likely have a recess, send the jury out immediately, and then inquire whether the witness has a basis, a good faith basis or reason to assert the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And then at that point, the judge would more than likely, if the person or the witness did not have their own attorney, would appoint them an attorney to advise them of their Fifth Amendment uh, rights and whether they in fact apply. Miss, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Your Honor, Are the witness already answered. Are you pleading the fifth because you were involved in Mr. Kimball's murder or because your of Honor, the Your Honor, it is not your place to ask my witness. Yes, it is, Mrs. Florick. Now, the attorney that was asking the questions really shouldn't be advocating for this client in any way other than saying, Your Honor, she's asserted her right. She should have independent counsel. Now. You are taking the fifth. Your Honor, if you compel my witness to answer this question, I am moving for an immediate mistrial. Denied. It's somewhat admirable uh, that the attorney would try to protect the witness to the point of even facing contempt, but that's really not her place as it relates to that particular witness. Mrs. You are piercing the Fifth Amendment right. Mrs. Forrick, shut up. No, sir. Excuse me? So as this scene develops, the court admonishes the attorney and tells her to shut up. And if she doesn't, she would in fact be held in contempt. As long as you are attempting to circumvent her Fifth Amendment right, I will not shut up. You will shut up or be held in contempt. That's realistic because to be held in direct contempt, the court kind of has to give you notice of what you're doing wrong. And if you do it again, there's going to be punishment. Then hold me in contempt. And I will refer this to the Judicial Conduct Committee for immediate action. But for an attorney to threaten the judge with a grievance um, is completely inappropriate. I've never seen it done. I just don't think it's very realistic at all. Next up, law and order. On the sole count of the indictment, murder in the second degree, how does the jury find? This clip almost works for me. When a jury comes back 
normally the judge will be the one that actually reads the verdict. I've never been in a courtroom where the foreperson reads the verdict. We find the defendant not guilty. Now, before the verdict is read, the court will also usually have security in the courtroom, and particularly in a large courtroom where there's a lot of emotion going on, the court would admonish everyone in the courtroom that there will be no outbursts, there will be no cheering or booing or any emotion whatsoever, and if you do so, you will be removed immediately by the sheriff. Now, in this particular case, people were reacting, hugging each other for television purposes, but that would not happen in most courtrooms. The judge wouldn't allow it. This is unrealistic in just about any jurisdiction I could possibly imagine. Most jurisdictions have court security personnel that you have to go through before you can enter the courthouse, so you're not gonna be able to bring guns and knives or anything of that nature into the courtroom. Next up, American Crime Story. Your Honor, at this time, the people would ask that Mr. Simpson step forward and try on the gloves recovered from Bundy and Rockingham. We have no objection, Your Honor. This clip is based on the real life trial of O.J. Simpson. He was ultimately acquitted. This is a good teaching point for what they teach you almost immediately in law school. Don't ask a question unless you know what the answer will be. Every trial, there's always that moment where something takes place and you just don't expect it. And sometimes it goes really well for you and sometimes not so well. You can tell from the scene that nobody anticipated this. The defense didn't know it was coming. Even Mr. Darden's co-counsel didn't know it was coming. Look at the apprehension on her face, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Mr. Simpson, please approach the jury. When Mr. Simpson walked over to the area in front of the jury, his legal team followed him. They were permitted to do that so that they could actually view what was taking place so that they could be able to cross-examine on those issues when it was their turn to cross-examine. These gloves are too small. This clip reminds me of a principle that you need to remember whenever you're trying a case. Keep it simple and don't get cute. Mr. Darden got a little too cute. Up next, the good fight. Unfortunately, I have misplaced my prescription glasses, so I will try to make do with these prescription sunglasses if you don't mind me looking a little bit like a movie star. So the first thing that I see here is a very well, informal judge. This is not that uncommon, but most of the time the judges like to be the standard bearer for the standard of decorum and the lack of formality really sets the tone for the courtroom. Mike, could you angle that screen some more? These sunglasses are polarized. Yeah. The judge forgets his glasses and moves about the courtroom and takes a closer look at the exhibit to help prove the witness wrong. Uh, continue, please. Typically, the court would not leave the bench to move around the courtroom to look at a particular piece of evidence. So in this scene, it's almost a conversation that's taking place between the judge the witness, the defense attorney, and the plaintiff's attorney. Very unusual. Even if it was just a trial to the court, the court would still, for purposes of making a record, allow one party to conduct their examination. The other party wouldn't be able to jump in and ask a question and then have it answered and then have the judge clarify. Oh, yes. Then why didn't the company fire him? Your Honor, I think it's a little odd that BMI is being censured for doing the humanitarian thing. Oh, I, I don't think plaintiff is censoring them. I think she just finds it odd that they kept the thief on staff, as do I. And most of the time, the judge is not going to allow a question to be answered simply because he'd like to hear the answer to it. There has to be a legal basis for that. Objection asked and answered. Uh, actually, no, I'd like to hear the answer. The judge actually points out for the attorney what the answer would be from the document. How many hours did you question my client? I don't know. I didn't keep track. Uh, well, uh, uh, it says seven hours here. That simply would not happen in a courtroom. The case should be tried by the attorneys and not the judge. Next up, Castle. This is the most unrealistic courtroom scene that I have ever seen. First of all, you have a witness on the stand, Castle, 
who's up there testifying as to whom he thinks the murderer is. Mr. Castle, yesterday you testified that my client was guilty of killing Mrs. Beekman. Do you still believe that's true? No. Nina's is innocent. Witnesses don't get to testify to that. They get to testify as to what they saw, what they heard, uh, what, what somebody said, if, it was a, if it's an admissible statement. They don't get to speculate, let alone change their mind on the witness stand based upon the attorney saying, is there anything else you would like to tell this jury? Mr. Castle, is there anything, is there anything else you'd like to share with the court? Yes. Good people of the jury. It that is. wouldn't happen. That's what they call a narrative. A narrative is when a question is asked of the witness and the witness just goes off and gives a lengthy uh, answer that really just amounts to a big run-on sentence. The bathroom downstairs was occupied. And they're really not answering the question that was asked anymore. They're just really talking about what they want to talk about. That's prohibited. It has to be question, answer, question, answer. So for him to go off and then point out the real killer in the courtroom. It was her husband, Lloyd Beekman. I have never seen anyone try to point out and say, that's the real killer sitting over there in the courtroom. And then the daughter jumps up and asks dad questions like, maybe you did do it. No, I, I remember because I was trying to find you guys. All right, that's enough. I want order. And then the detective gets up and starts interrogating this man now accused of murder in the courthouse, in the courtroom, in front of the jury. So you headed out to the yard. You moved the basketball hoop over so you could climb up it and get a better look. But Sadie caught you, spying in the window, didn't she? So you came inside and accused her of having an affair with Roger. Dad, what did you do? What did I do? Your mother was having an affair with her. It would never happen. It just would never happen. The only thing that this scene was missing was for the Scooby-Doo clan to pull the masks off somebody's head and the person say, I would have got away with it if it wasn't for those pesky kids. Mr. Beekman, you're under arrest for murder. Come on. This was cartoonish and amateurish at best and whoever wrote it and allowed it to go on screen should be fired and never be allowed to write again. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> It's true, that's terrible. Next up, the Big Bang Theory. Before we get to the courthouse, I'd like to call on your skills as an actress. So in this scene, Sheldon has to go to court for a traffic ticket, and he scripted the testimony of Penny to appear in court and testify on his behalf. What is this? I've taken the liberty of scripting your appearance on the witness stand because, let's face it, you're somewhat of a loose cannon. Now, now this is a very lighthearted scene. But one thing is very realistic. When you go to court, you want your witnesses to be prepared, but you cannot script the testimony and give that script to the witness to prepare in preparation for their testimony. Do you remember that date? Darn tootin', I do. <laughs> if the court will excuse my homespun, corn-fed Nebraskan turn of phrase. <laughs> Excellent, go on. Anytime you call a witness, you want to make sure that you have prepared them so they know what subjects they're going to cover. And sometimes you may have practiced it, but you don't want to practice it so much and rehearse it so much that it appears to be rehearsed. The reason that date is like so totally fixed in my memory is that I had the privilege to be witness to one of the most heroic acts I've ever seen in like ever. If you were to draft a question and answer of the answers that you were in fact, looking for it to be given in court. And the other side asked, was there anything that you did to prepare for this hearing? And you said, yes, I read the script that my attorney gave me of his questions. Those questions would have to be turned over so that the other side could review them for cross-examination. So you would never, ever give a witness the questions to be read beforehand because if the question was ever asked, and most attorneys never ask that particular question, but if they did, they'd have to be produced. It could be very embarrassing for everyone involved. A, a teardrop rolls down my cheek. <laughs> Only a suggestion. A catch in your throat would work just as well. <laughs> but it is a fact that it's a privilege to know you. 
Totally. Sometimes you want to present your witness in a particular way or a particular light that may not exactly be as who they are in everyday life. However, juries are very smart people. They can see when you are trying to BS them. And if you try to change the way somebody comes across on the witness stand, they will be able to see it. Our next clip is from The Practice. In this scene, Eugene is at the appellate courts to receive a decision based upon an appeal of a murder case. We unanimously find the confession to be admissible. The conviction therefore stands. This scene is very unrealistic. Rarely does an appellate court ever issue a oral decision. They're always in writing. An appellate court is a court that reviews a lower court's decision to make sure that no legal errors were made that resulted in an unfair trial. Adjourned. With permission to address the court? Permission to address this court? When the case is over and the matter is in recess, the case is over. For an attorney to ask to address the court to explain their decision wouldn't happen in any way. Ten years I've been putting them back out there. Criminals, sometimes rapists, sometimes murderers. Ten years, all the time telling myself there's a reason. You're ten seconds from a contempt order. Do it! And the rant that Eugene goes off towards these judges and is ultimately held in contempt for would never ever happen and you would be held in contempt. Take him and put him in lockup. I'll rot in that cell. If giving you respect is a condition for my getting out. One can be held in contempt for not following the rules of the court. And the contempt proceeding is really to cleanse the dignity of the court. That's the realistic part about it. Next up, law and order. Doctor, is it not a fact that you had six bourbons on the rocks at Chance's Pub not 45 minutes ago? In this scene, the prosecutor asks the witness, the defendant, to take a sobriety test to prove that he has a drinking problem, which would ultimately lead to his culpability. The prosecutor had his investigator, a police officer, follow the good doctor to see what he did over the noon hour. And the officer investigator saw that the doctor had had several drinks over that noon hour. That many? The attorney had a good faith basis to inquire about whether the doctor had had anything to drink prior to taking the witness stand again. What's going on, Mr. Stone? This doctor wants to look drunk to you, Young. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Normally, a judge would not allow the prosecution to have somebody get up and do a roadside sobriety test to see if they're intoxicated. Raise your arm to the level of your shoulder, close your eyes, and point to your nose with your index finger. In this particular case, the prosecutor got lucky because the doctor basically put his finger in his eye. However, had he been able to touch his nose accurately, it would have sunk the prosecution's case. Going back to the simple thing, don't get cute and don't ask questions you don't know the answer to. He knew the answer of whether he had drinks. He didn't know if he would properly touch his finger to the nose during the test. In the next clip, Perry Mason. I remember as a kid watching reruns of Perry Mason, and if you went to law school, you certainly watched a few Perry Mason episodes. The killer accidentally overheard Thompson's phone call to Vivian Ames, a phone call setting up a perfect alibi for him. The first thing that I notice is how close the attorney is to the witness stand. That rarely ever happens. You always have to stay at the podium and have to ask permission to get that close. And then he killed Ned Thompson. No, no, I didn't do those things. I didn't kill Ned Thompson. And you didn't plant Fallon's note in no, his pocket? No, no! I have never seen such high drama in the courtroom, and I've never seen a witness be cross-examined so intensely that apparently the attorney then figures out who the real killer is and points him out in the courtroom. You didn't kill Thompson. But you did, Mr. Wells. Yes! Yes, I killed Ned Thompson! And not only does he stand up and say, yes, I did it, he collapses in tears 
while he's doing it. And yet everybody remains completely calm and silent in front of the jury. Unrealistic. Night court. Unfortunately, word got out that anyone not arraigned before midnight was set free. Oh, we were so close. Oh, what jumped out at me in this no, scene at first was, I'm not aware of any particular situation where if the charges were not advised by a particular time, that the case would be dismissed. In this scene here, the prosecutor actually grabs the charges and reads them in a speed reading format so that the defendant is aware of them. Count one, the other side declaring complaint states without prejudice to these informed police wants such information. Normally, it's the court that advises a defendant of the charges against him and the rights that come with him when he, in fact, becomes a defendant. This is a very fun scene. It adds a little bit of levity to the situation, which is oftentimes a very uh, serious uh, time for uh, a defendant in a particular case, but it's just not very realistic. My God, man! As you can see, Hollywood gets lots of things correct and lots of things wrong. Court is not as always dramatic as they make it out to be in the movies or on TV, but there is always something monumental going on there for the participants that are involved.